All right, welcome back. For this final installment, no more fun and games, folks. Since the last episode, I've added a simple course builder using hex shapes. And now, we have the ability to make a large number of courses very quickly. So, real quick, before we begin, let's just make this arbitrary course and test the forest that we last left off with on part two to see how well he'd do. Yeah. Okay, let's get into this. Let's finally try and make Forrest to any course running master that he's always dreamt of becoming. And to do this, we first need a goal. So how about this? I've designed a campaign mode of four increasing in difficulty courses and one final course that is the monster of a course previewed in part one and two. If Forrest can successfully run two laps on each course in both directions, then he will be dubbed the any course running master. So here are my training tactics. Looking at the campaign maps, I think the first two or three are going to be pretty easy, but it's really the last couple that we need to worry about. They have lots of turns, corners, confusing intersections, and this is about as all as I can identify for training purposes. So here are three forest brain training tactics that I want to try. Tactic number one, the forest dedicated tactic. When I think of training, the first thing that comes to mind is the natural process of going from one stage to the next until you're good. And that natural process is what inspired forest dedicated. I'm first going to train forest on a very simple course, then make sure that he matches masters that course then move him on to a more complicated course and I will keep up this process until he is able to be the toughest course that I can throw at him. I mean you'd agree this is how most natural processes in life works right? So this should be our campaign winner right? Tactic number two the Forrest Gump tactic. I think the most obvious thing to do but maybe not the smartest is to try and design the toughest course possible and then train Forrest right away on that course. The idea is to get Forrest to master every crevice of that course because if he can handle the toughest course that I can throw at him then hey he should be able to handle any course in the campaign right and tactic number three forest calculated this tactic is more of a mathematical approach to training we're going to first train forest on a circular course I hypothesize that this will give us a surefire thought process that can handle general turning then we'll train a completely new force on a course with a lot of 90 degree or less sharp corners I hypothesize of course that this will give us a thought process that can handle sharp corners and then we'll train a final force on a course with lots of confusing intersections. It's my belief that this will give us a thought process that will know what to do in confusing pockets like this. And finally, we'll use all three of the trained forest thought processes to train on the toughest course I can make to hopefully make one ultimate trained forest. Once I have forest dedicated, forest gump, and forest calculated trained to the best that I can train them, we will then put them to the test live and see if they will be able to beat the campaign, dubbing one or maybe even all of them the any course running master. And me, the greatest trainer of all time? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm about to explode from all this excitement to find out. But before we can start training, there's something that we need to take care of first. If you remember, last episode we left off with two crossover functions that we were unsure which would be better to use for final training. And so, since the last episode, I've added some graphs to get to the bottom of this. The green bars indicate an increase in performance, the red bars indicate a decrease in performance, and the yellow bar indicates the top performance for this training session. The left side shows the top fitness per day, and the right side shows the average fitness per day. So using these graphs, let's run some tests and hypothesize which might give us a better chance at success. Let the training begin. Ooh, all right guys, after some 12 plus hours of training, I've got some great data to show you. I've ran both crossover functions five times for 60 in-game days each, using two different courses total. But that's not all. There's something that I've oddly been keeping a secret from you. In part two, I said that our genetic algorithm will assign a probability to each thought process to indicate their chances to be used for the next day. Well, I was unsure if this was the most optimal way to go about it, so I also added another selection function called top two, in which every new thought process for the next day is instead based off of only the top two best thought processes. So looking at these graphs, that's what you're seeing. And if it's still a bit confusing, imagine a simple Putnam square with the two crossover functions on the top and the two selection functions on the left. I've tested each combination to try and find out which might be the best. 
And here are my takeaways. Looking at the first graph, which visualizes the average top fitness from all five runs per day, the slice crossover mixed with the top two selection method performed the worst, followed by arguably the slice slash probability method, then the random crossover slash top two selection method, and in first place, the random slash probability method. When I first looked at this data, I was shocked and actually a bit offended because I mean, based on my quick Google search from part two, I think nature uses the slice slash probability method. So naturally, that's what I have my money on. No one insults nature, except this genetic algorithm, I guess. But as I took a step back and realized this isn't nature, it's a computer simulation over 60 in-game days opposed to billions of years of evolution. And that's when this data actually started to make a lot more sense to me. As I think the chart shows, the slice crossover function is generally quicker at finding solutions, but it's also more likely to get stuck in the local minimum. If we were to flip this graph upside down, I think the local minimum becomes easier to visualize. This here is the global minimum, and all of these are local minimums. Now why is the slice crossover function more likely to get stuck in local minimums? Well, if we take a look at our second graph, which visualizes the averages of the average fitness from all five training sessions per day, take a second to let that register and continue. The peaks and troughs don't stray too far away from each other, which I think indicates that the slice function results in most thought processes being similar to each other with only slight variation. Thus, it doesn't explore the search space as well as the random crossover does. Now, if we were to compare these to the peaks and troughs of the random crossover function, you'll see that its averages have major rises and drops, which shows that the random crossover is making huge changes to look for new solutions. Sometimes it finds them and we see major rises, and other times it doesn't find it. In fact, it decreases performance and we see major drops. But what's important is that it's exploring. The slice crossover is more or less designed to play it safe. Like someone who only makes small safe investments in companies like Apple, Microsoft, Disney, you get it. They could become rich from this, but it might take them some time to get there. While the random crossover function is more like someone who makes big risky investments in startups like napkins on wheels, soggy cereal restaurant, and Donald Trump's second term. Some investments will be a complete waste of money, but others will turn great reward. Well, at least that's what I got from the graphs. If you see something else, feel free to post it in the comments and let's discuss it. So with that said, it appears that the con for the slice crossover is that it takes a lot longer to have a breakthrough. But when it does, because it's exploring the search space so meticulously, its pro is that it will ideally continue to improve until its next breakthrough, which pretty much means better accuracy. And it appears that the pro for the random crossover function is because it's a lot more daring, it explores the search space a lot better than the slice crossover. But it also appears that this can lead to a loss of progress. It can find a good solution, be unsure if this is the best solution or not, make a giant change, then drop in performance, sometimes not recovering for a very long time or ever as good as it once was. To just look at the data from another perspective, I also took the data from these two graphs and graphed it using the mean and median from every day. And these graphs point clearly to the random slash probability method being the most efficient way to train force. On average, the random slash probability method has a higher fitness and also has a higher fitness midpoint, which a high fitness midpoint indicates that this huge change method finds better solutions faster. But Nature, don't be fooled. You're still number one. You just needed more time. We still love and support you. Okay, looking at this data, which one has your vote? I don't know about you, I'm for sure going with the random slash probability method. However, because I ran a poll on Twitter and YouTube and you guys overwhelmingly voted to test both crossover functions in final training and uh, even though it's gonna take double the training time and the data right here in our face is telling us that the random slash probability method is the chosen one, I have to remember. This is for machine learning research. So let's do it. Besides, what if I have no idea how to analyze data correctly and random slash probability method actually isn't the chosen one? This might be interesting after all. But real quick, seeing how bad the top two selection function performed, let's not even waste our time with it. So, instead of training three forests with only the random slash probability method, we're also gonna train three more forests using the slice slash probability method and test all six forests on the campaign mode. So, without further yapping at the mouth, let the actual training be.
boy, <laughs> that was some intense training. But at last, we have our six fours. Now, who's ready to put them to the test? All right, Forrest, on your mark, get set, run. What? No, it wasn't supposed to end like this. We're supposed to dub one of these forests as the any course running master. Ah, uh, well, guys, we tried. And frankly, that's the end of this project because I'm ready to move on to more fun machine learning projects. However, it's not the end of this series. I expected to beat the campaign, but we didn't. So I'm gonna upload an actual final part four next week, which will be a postmortem on Run Forest. I'll talk about the various things that I learned during this project and why I think we were unsuccessful in dubbing Forest as any course running master. I think I have a good idea why. The legit final and last part four is coming next week and I hope to see you then. All right guys, if you're enjoying this project and really want to help me out, consider doing these things. Subscribe to my channel and hit that bell icon for upload notifications, leave a like on this video, and share this video with a friend. All that stuff helps out a lot more than you probably think. And I thank you greatly for your support. Also, I'm now taking suggestions, so if there's any type of game or app or software that you want me to make, leave your suggestion in the comments below, or even better, tweet it to me. I'm a bit of a Twitter addict, and I'd love to talk to you on Twitter. Any followers can follow me, I can follow me. But, whatever the case may be, remember to always feed your curiosity.